My name is Mark Lorinsky, and I'm a co-chair of Blue Wave New Jersey's Healthcare Committee. As part of Blue Wave New Jersey's ongoing speaker series, I recently sat down to talk with Barbara Rosen. Barbara is the Vice President of the Health Professionals and Allied Employees, HPAE, New Jersey's largest health professionals union, which represents many of the heroes who staff our hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare institutions. For the past four decades, Barbara has been fighting for the rights and safety of healthcare workers in New Jersey and the country. We are honored that Barbara joined us to discuss the unbelievable work that healthcare workers are doing and the many challenges they face during this unprecedented and dangerous time. Uh, why don't you just, you know, tell me some specifics about how, um, you know, your members and, and other healthcare workers are faring, have been faring in the last several months and where things are now. So uh, we had a call yesterday with our executive council. I think there's 36 of our frontline workers who are, were on the call. And, you know, aside from other things, what came out of it is that they're, they're very stressed. We're starting to see the, the, um, the result of the stress and strain that they've been through. They're reporting uh, depression, um, some of them when they're even talking about the conditions in the hospital and when what they went through um, couldn't stop from welling up and, and crying, which has been the, the case even on the, the phone over the last few weeks with our, our members. You know, healthcare workers, you know, by nature are probably the most compassionate people on the planet. You know, so to be thrown into a situation that is above their capacity to perform and to see the extent of the death and the suffering that they've been through has had a very heavy toll on, on them. Um, you know, they're reporting having to see people die alone because there's no visitors allowed yeah. into the, the hospitals. Um, and that goes into the supply issues. Somebody was telling us yesterday that their facility ran out of body bags and they were, were using garbage bags to, to uh, wrap the, the body. So it's always going to be um, a flashback, I think, with a lot of the, these people. And, and right now we're, we're looking at services to address the, the mental health issues that are emerging. Um, um. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's kind of where we are now. Huh? It seems like the hospitals are slowing down a little bit. Um, they're not up to capacity and over capacity where where they are, where where they were. But early on, um, as you know, our front line workers were, were thrown into a situation without the adequate protective gear that they they needed. Right. And so compounding the, the stress of the, the job with the sickness and the dying, right. they also had the fear that they would get infected and bring it home to their, their family. So it was like going into a three alarm fire with, with, with water pistols. Um, you know, they didn't have the, the gear. It was the way they described it. It was like the DJ of healthcare. Wow. You know, they boarded into a, a situation and they didn't know where they were going and whether they were going to come out of it. So we've had a lot of, you know, ramifications um, from it. Right. Uh, we right. know that the, the federal government was woefully unprepared to handle this pandemic, right? So right. that had led to oh, supply wow. issues that right. everybody is aware of. Right. Right. So um, our members were working without protective gear. Right. Um, they did not have N95 masks to go in. Right. When some of them tried to bring in their own equipment, they were disciplined. We had one member, and actually it was a president of our local who was fired for advocating for um, protective gear. He was going to a, a hearing with a, a member. And we've seen this all across the the state for the, the most part in our, our facilities. Um, okay, the CDC guidance 
has been very confusing. Um, it's been not consistent. Um, and we know that the CDC guidance was, was based on supply and not on the um, evidence-based practice that they usually work on. Mm -hmm. Even with, you know, the DIM CDC guidance, a lot of our facilities did not even follow that. We right now have um, a slew of OSHA complaints out. They haven't fit tested our members with, with N95 masks. Um, there's been a flood of um, K95s, which are not adequate that hospitals have been, been using. Mm -hmm. um, more recently, they've been running out of gowns and we have members wearing garbage bags. We even had one facility that was laundering um, disposable um, paper-based gowns to, to reuse. Um, they haven't been provided shoe coverings and head coverings. And the result of it is that everybody has been scrambling for supplies. Um, the state police have been helping us um, get some supplies that we distribute to our, our members. We've had local groups like donating things like shower caps from the, the dollar store. Um, and it's, it's been a scramble for um, PPE. We've had a lot of members um, that have fallen ill. Um, we know of four that have died. We have other members that have been on the front line that um, are on ventilators as we speak. They're in, in critical condition. With it, another issue that we're having is that most of the hospitals aren't releasing the numbers of employees that have tested positive or have been out ill, okay? or even have died, um, it's like a, a big secret. You know, the only logical conclusion that we could come to is that they're not releasing the information for one, they don't want to be liable, okay? Um, even though they've misused in many cases the dim guidance that the CGC has sent out, and they don't want to destroy the image of of their facility. Right. So Sir, right now we're working, yeah, we're working on, on legislation. Okay. Um, yeah, to be sure that these numbers are released. You know, our position is that, that workers have the right to know the risks of their workplace. And that could be the number of their um, co-workers that, that are ill. Um, so, you know, we're hoping that the hospitals now will increase their way that they're contact tracing, because a lot of our members probably have fallen ill um, due to, um, you know, probably asymptomatic or presumptive patients that have, have been in and work with them without the proper PPE, which they, they should have had all, all along with it. And, you know, so we're expecting a lot of issues to come from that because a lot of the facilities will probably try to say that it was community acquired exposure mm -hmm. um, and not workplace ex exposure, um, even though we know that they haven't been working with the, the proper PPE. It struck me, uh, I, I shared with you that, that my uh, w wife who's now retired uh, was a healthcare worker in a hospital and a union member. Um, that you have always have this mix because um, healthcare workers are indeed, uh, from the public at large's standpoint, heroes right now. And no one is, you know, can say they're not. Um, management of healthcare institutions have the potential to rise to the occasion and to, to do what their mission is supposed to be and also to protect their workers. But sometimes, you know, you hear these horror stories where they have this institutional like uh, circle the wagons, you know, this is our show and we're not gonna get, you know, be transparent. Um, I read somewhere maybe a month or so ago, of at least one case uh, where in one institution, people were told initially not to wear masks because they didn't want to scare anybody, you know. Right, uh, that's, that's the truth. 
Yeah. So you, I mean, yeah. as a, as the, as the union and the representative of your members, I mean, you have to deal with both issues. You know, protecting protecting patients, protecting the public at large, protecting your members too, uh, which also protects the public at large. You know, the other thing is with the the CDC guidance about return to work, it's a lot laxer in the the hospital, right? Yeah. So, like for an example, we had a member that was a nurse that was overseas um, they, at the time when they closed the borders. So she flew back in, she landed in Newark, she was screened in, in Newark, um, and she was told that she had to self-quarantine for 14 days, right? When she called her facility, they said, no, you have to return to work in three days if you don't have any symptoms, and they gave her a surgical mask. Oh my. So this puts patients, you know, um, our workers have had to go to work back to work sooner than the, the guidance. Um, they've been working sick in many cases, like told to, to mask. And this is not safe for the, the patients. You know, and I think some of the patients or pe prospective patients realize that they're afraid to go to the hospital because if they don't go in with COVID, they might come out with, with COVID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our members have been, um, you know, not, not treated well in, in that respect. Our hospitals have been historically understaffed. Right. It's been um, an issue that we've been fighting for years. Um, we have gotten nowhere with it. The legislation keeps, legislators keep knocking it, it down. I think the reason is because we're up against very strong lobbies with the hospital administrations, hospital association and some of the larger mega hospital chains, right? So, you know, they see nursing ratios or an increase as, you know, loss of their, their profits. Sure. So on the whole, like in, in New Jersey and, and I think around the, the country, this whole pandemic has really literally unmasked the woes of our, our healthcare system. It's, you know, we're talking a little bit about a mission before, you know, their, their mission is, is profit generated period, okay? And that puts some of our safety net hospitals in, in risks. Like, you know, our university hospital in, in Newark has been underfunded, you know, um, for years. You know, they, they need more funding. Um, another safety net hospital is, is Bergen Newbridge mm. um, Medical Center. It just went from a, a for-profit to a not-for-profit that is committed to continuing the, the mission of, of the hospital, but they, they need funding to um, exist. Um, and without these safety net hospitals, there is going to be a larger, much larger problem. Um, Another issue is the Department of Health, you know, under the Christie administration was totally eviscerated. Um, you know, at a time when the hospitals were merging and going for profit and probably needed more oversight than they ever have. Now I've been a nurse for 45 years. You know, I, I see myself as the, the history of nursing since Florence Nightingale's time. And, you know, over the, the years, it's really has changed the, the mission and we really needed the Department of Health to, uh, I'm sorry, our landscapers are out there. I, I can still hear you. The Department of Health. Okay, uh, the Department of, of Health, you know, we needed more enforcement and more interaction by the, the Department of Health. So, you know, with our, our new administration, we have Judy Percy Kelly, and, you know, she walked into a department that was woefully understaffed and, you know, hit with this, this huge pan, pandemic all at the, the same time, mm -hmm. where there weren't pandemic plans or it doesn't appear to be, we've tried to over them, we haven't gotten anything back, uh, pandemic plans from the, the hospitals or, or from the, the state. So what it led to was a total chaotic uh, situation. You know, everybody was going to anywhere that they, they can to procure, you know, ventilators and, and, and PPE. And I just hope for the next wave, and we will have another wave of this pandemic um, that we're a lot better prepared on it. 
You mentioned ventilators. I, think uh, I, I have a personal story on that, and maybe you're aware of it. I contributed to a GoFundMe for, for ventilators at University Hospital, where my, my wife used to work. Um, they were using the portable ventilators in the ambulances, which had ran on batteries. So I had to contribute. I mean, I just could not contribute to a GoFundMe to, to buy the batteries for those ventilators. You know, we should never have to be in that position. No, I no, I know, right? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Do you have um, members of the union who work for nursing homes too? We hear so many horror yeah. stories coming from uh, nursing homes and assisted livings. Um, what, what do you hear specific to that? I mean, you know, nursing home patients are more susceptible, you know, to having, you know, um, bad outcomes from, from COVID. All of our nursing homes have been very, very understaffed. Right. Um, certified nurses aides, there's been a shortage in, in New Jersey, um, and that has led to very much of a shortage. But, you know, part of the, the plan with hospitals reporting their numbers of employees or the workforce that test sick is to go back and, and analyze it, right? Like, what job titles have the, the most? What percentage of your employees became ill? And you know what we're seeing, and they're not our members, but we've had transporters, um, CNAs um, died on the you know, aside from the, um, the licensed staff, you know, so that, that should be trended out. Is it a training issue? Is it because they've had less PPE, maybe than the, the doctors and the nurse in the ICU? Like that all has to be analyzed and, and remediated, you know, going, going forward. But there has not been, um, uh, we have asked for um, numbers of, of positive COVID positive um, you know employees um, some some hospitals have given it to us two out of our, our 20 um, the others say what do you need it for we're not giving it to you uh, wow. you know so, um, um, but you know they really need to do an analysis of, of the the workforce and get to the the root of why so many are uh, testing positive some might be community Okay, but we're saying, you know, if you're working in a hospital and you're on a front line and you're transporting a patient that has COVID and you don't have PPE, that it, it's, it's a workplace exposure. A personal physician of mine who has been around the, the New Jersey health care system for a lot of years, uh, unprompted, shared with me uh, recently, he said, well, you know, like all this thing of not having enough capacity and having to do capacity on the fly could perhaps have been avoided if New Jersey hadn't gone crazy. And I, I don't think we're the only state who went crazy, closing down hospitals, closing down floors and beds. Uh, you know, I don't know if that was driven uh, by, by the health insurance industry. Um, you have a comment on, on his uh, observation? Uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of hospitals uh, close and, and go bankrupt. And, it, you know, I don't know the, the root of it, check on, on it, but, you know, it's just the symptomatic of the sick healthcare. Our healthcare system is sick right. with it. And so we have these mega systems that are emerging. And, you know, they, there's, it's to a point where it's affecting the, there's going to be a lack of competition, right? So there's going to be, I think we can actually see prices and, and costs go, go up and not, not down, but you know, I can't comment further than, than that on it. Sure. sure. So you're talking about, well, you know, it's just very striking that, you know, an organization like the HPIE, you know, because you represent the, the frontline, uh, you know, emergency workers, uh, essential workers, um, is in a unique position to let the rest of us know what's going on and get the word out about all these weaknesses that really have to be addressed. Um, to what extent is the healthcare uh, industry, the hospitals, uh, even unionized in New, in New Jersey? And I imagine New Jersey's probably uh, got some stronger unionization uh, than, than some other places because we have a history on that. But 
Um, to what extent are, are we there? With, with unionization? Yeah, here, here in New Jersey in, in hospitals and other healthcare institutions. You, you know, it, it, it needs to be ramped up. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but you know, our power has been weakened over the years again by the, uh, you know, the, the growth of these, you know, mega healthcare systems, right? So, you know, the percentage of unionized employees within a system becomes less. Yeah. You know, so that's uh, affected us. But we do have a coalition with the other healthcare um, unions in, in the state that we've been working with um, on a lot of different things. But on on the whole, I think the unionized facilities have, have done a lot more than the um, non-unionized facilities for their employees. You know, we have the, the capacity to, you know, file OSHA complaints and you know, work out legislation and, you know, s step in and, and represent our, our members. I think, you know, unions are going to be the survival of quality health care in, in our facilities. You know, at least, you know, we've had some enforcement. We've seen some of the facilities try to, um, what, what they call us, they're, they're deploying our staff, right? So you might have like a, a nurse that worked in mother baby that might be deployed to work in ICU during the pandemic, right? That's like very uh, dangerous for for the patient. So a union would, you know, set boundaries on, you know, how an, uh, uh, an employee could be working mm -hmm. with it. Well, it looks like a daunting task to contact Trace. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, we don't have any information that our hospitals are, are doing a good job of contact tracing within their small facilities. So we're waiting to see how this is going to work out. Wow. Um, I, on the national level, um, you know, we, we, we're not nearly anywhere past this. We're, I don't know where we are in it, but it's like, you know, we, we we know that it's going to be quite a while and, and going to be a lot more tests for us. Um, there is a big battle brewing, as I'm sure you're aware, about funding, you know, whether we're going to continue to fund the needs of the states, of the, the, the frontline workers. Um, if there is a shortfall in future funding bills and, you know, they're going to stiff states, they may who knows what's going to happen with Medicaid funding to the state? You know that, that our healthcare institutions are so dependent on that. Any uh, any comments that you'd like to share about how you see that playing out, and what we could hopefully be doing? I mean, the only comment that I, I have on that is some of the the comments by by Trump and some of those Republican allies have been discussed him. Okay, that they're not giving to blue states, um, you know, and, you know, they, they have to understand that, you know, this is, pandemic's not a red pandemic, it's not a blue pandemic, you know, it's, it's an American pandemic, and the way we have worked with Florida and Texas during hurricanes is how the federal government should be working now with, with some of the states like New Jersey and New York that are at the epicenter of this pandemic. I'm almost finished with all the, my questions for you. Uh, I, I mean, you may have a bunch of other things that you think we should share, but I was curious and I think uh, the, the people, uh, you know, that, that I'm in touch with who are on the blue wave mailing list might also be curious. I saw your bio on uh, the union's page. I saw how you started, you know, were one of the people who started a local a lot of years ago and that you had uh, experienced uh, a needle stick from um, a, uh, a, a, a an HIV or um, uh, a, another infected needle situation. I to see the patient had both of them, yeah. Oh my goodness. And then, and then you went to work and the union went to work in not only organizing a union in that location, but also to, to go to Trenton and, and get legislation about that. Tell us about that, if you don't mind. Tell me. Uh, well, you know, the, the union 
back then, you know, I've been at the same facility since I got out of nursing school, which is like 45 years, all right? Mm. So it was back then, it was, it was Bergen um, Pines, and uh, we unionized. I mean, I was one of, I wasn't the main person that unionized, but I was on the, the ground floor when it went from non-union to a union facility. Uh, we joined um, Genesso. And back then, the reason for our unionization was that the, the hospital um, was infested with cockroaches okay. and we never had linen, okay? I remember these are two big causes and it was falling on deaf ears, you know? So we unionized mainly to improve the conditions at the, the hospital. You know, um, back then nurses' salaries were, were very, very, very low. Um, somebody that I went to nursing school, she worked at ShopRite or a supermarket, I think it was ShopRite, and actually had to take a pay cut to be an RN in a, a hospital. Um, it was somewhere about $4.30 an hour okay, back, back then that we we're getting. So, I mean, over the years, the union, you know, has helped our, our wages. And then we joined HPAE about 1990 or so. Um, that became our, our union. But yeah, I did get stuck, stuck. Um, and our union went and we got um, legislation on, on it passed. It, it took a long time to, to get it through. Um, I remember one New Jersey senator when I was testifying said it takes a real klutz to get stuck with a needle. Um, I've never forgotten that. No. Uh, he's still in office. He's still in um, office. Yes, I don't, I'm not going to reveal a, a name, but it was somebody that should have known better. Um, yeah, so, and, and actually our legislation was um, the model and it's stronger, was, you know, as strong as California's and became the model for the national legislation on, on that. So there is a national uh, law. Right. That. right. I mean, currently, you know, before the pandemic, we've been working, there's been a lot of violence in, in the hospital. We've had... Um, our members getting beat up, you know, it's, it's been an, an alarming, an alarming uh, rate on it. Um, we've had members that have been out of work over a year due injuries that they've su sustained. Um, so there is, um, there is regulations um, in, in New Jersey, but they're not enforced at all, you know, do the, due to the, the lack of staffing in the department. So we've been working with our, our mother union, uh, the American Confederation of, of Teachers, to get national legislation passed um, to have OSHA have some enforcement power to, uh, you know, to support um, violence prevention in our institutions. And, you know, basically, it's like you do an assessment you determine where the risks are, right? It's training. It's a lot of items that are basically not a big ticket item. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's a committee. It's it's looking at the, the cases that, you know, violence has occurred and doing a root cause analysis, you know, to try to, to, to mitigate it. And the, the legislation has um, come up with opposition you know, from the, the red side of the, the aisle, and it, it's still uh, out there, so. Yeah, wow. It's, you, know, you wonder what people are thinking. They don't want their state to have health care. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I know that this happens, but it's still mind-boggling that it does. Well, um, we have a, a law in New Jersey. You know, it's just not enforced. We want OSHA to have some enforcement. Right, I saw I saw on the union site that one of the, one of the legislative priorities is that OSHA should even have a standard that is specific to COVID nineteen and other viruses. Right, and that is not no not in the regs right now, and that's amazing. And now, um, I, you know, I, we I, I sent out an email to people, you know, that we should contact our our our, uh, our reps in in Congress. Now it's going to be incorporated in the. Uh, the omnibus um, uh, pandemic uh, legislation in, that just came out this week from the House, but we have the the, the Senate side is like, you know, well, it's dead on arrival. You know, it, it's crazy. The, the, and 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 how you could not enforce that, and and have real, you know, it's like, 
I don't, I don't think people know this, you know, just how, how weak uh, things have gotten. Well, we have a very, um, a labor department that is very unfriendly to the workers right right now on the, the federal level. So that's, you know, part of, of the, the problem. And, you know, the healthcare system is, is tipped towards the employer and, and profits. Okay, anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, but, you know, if you have, you have anything else, uh, you know, thank you for inviting us on this. I'm going to have that legislation sent to you and um, you know how to reach me. Um, uh, yeah, I got your email and your phone. Yeah, and, and thank, thank you very much and stay safe. Thank, thank you, Barb. You've been very generous with your time and, and this information. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. You'll be, you'll be there. You too. Bye-bye.